and the more you get in this book and the more you study and the more you read and the more you pray, uh, you, you, you start to see these things. And, and, and many times, many times you start seeing things that you've never seen in passages before that will come alive. And many times you're going to see the world from where you sit. As your pastor, I have traditionally focused the Palm Sunday messages on Holy Week, and that's okay. And we're going to see that from the Holy Week, but this week I'm going to share a fascinating story that's going to say everything about what represents Palm Sunday. And it's the time that Jesus raised Lazarus out of that grave. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. A beautiful story. And according to Bible scholars, there's evidence. We know for sure that it's happened in the town of Bethany, okay? The town of Bethany. And Bethany's about 1.7 miles from Jerusalem. Now, when you look at this, when you look at this, when you look at this, okay, you're going to see that, that we think that most biblical scholars believe that this was probably on Friday or Saturday, Friday or Saturday before Palm Sunday. So, so Jesus knew this was going to happen. He strategically planned all this. Now, we don't know exact time. We don't know the exact date, just like we don't know exactly when Christmas was. I know, like for, the, for example, like the Anglican Church and, and several others will, will uh, uh, celebrate uh, a, a thing called Lazarus Saturday, okay? And, and you're going to see that. But here's, 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 here's what I want you to think about. Jesus gave, Jesus gave the disciples an incredible strategic message and many signs, just like he's giving us the same signs today, but a lot of times we won't see it we won't, because we're not looking at it. And I'm going to tell you all that Lazarus' death symbolizes everything in our life on earth. It does. Everything that some of you are going through right now, it could be the death of a loved one. The loss of a job, the straying of a child that you love dearly, but also a child that's sick. We all going through it. See little Barry there. Somebody say, Barry, I love you, buddy. Thank you for being here today. It just means the world to me. And every time I could just preach better when you're in the room. Just kidding. But somebody shout amen. <laughs> And I got a smile out of him. But I'm going to tell you guys, it symbolizes our last enemy. And who is our last enemy? It's death. It's death. The last enemy is death. And the title of our grave, to, our, our grave today is the grave robber. That's who our Savior is. He's a grave robber. And we're going to be uh, in John chapter 11, 38. Um, 44, but we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to go ahead and pray because instead of giving you a background on this text before I preach it expositorily, I'm going to actually read starting in John 11, chapter 1. Gracious Lord in heaven, we love you and we praise you. We thank you. We thank you for this beautiful Palm Sunday that we can and say, Thus saith the Lord. And Lord, I just ask that you give me the strength, give me your wisdom, give me your mercy. And I'm so honored to preach your word, but I'm so honored with this congregation, that you just fill disciples. We are so blessed with so many disciples in this room, Lord, and we're thankful, we're thankful, Lord, and I just pray that you would surround them with your angels, and we worship you on this Palm Sunday. We ask these things in the blessed name of Jesus, we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. okay, now I want you to start here. We're going to, instead of giving you a background on the text, I'm just going to read the text, okay, because the most powerful thing you could do a lot of the Bible is just read the Bible. That gives a reason that it was written this way. So we're going to start with John chapter 11, and we're going to start with verse 1, okay? And I love that baby singing. That baby is singing because, you know, I'm going to tell you what I say. The sign of a healthy church is singing babies and singing men, amen? amen. And so that baby, can, she's got the Holy Spirit in her right now, and she's beautiful, so just let her talk. So here we go. We're going to talk about John 11, chapter, uh, John chapter 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was sick. Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his, his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, 
and the Son of God may be glorified through it. Jesus is sending the message right here. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. So he heard that he was sick and he stayed two more days in this place where he was. And then after he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. <clears throat> Verse 8, the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you. And you, are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because of the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that, he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Verse 12, then the disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. And then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Think about that. Lazarus is dead. Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes I was not there. Now I want you to think, I just want you to imagine the shock on the disciples' face when they said that. I was not there, and you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Now look here in verse 16. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go that we may die with him. Man, Thomas, what a buzzkill that dude was, right? <laughs> you know, think about it. Thomas is always doubting. You know, he had to see Jesus nail scarred hands, right? He was always doubting. Oh, let's just go die with you, Jesus. I'm the resurrection. Oh, I'm sorry. So, I'm getting ahead of myself. So Jesus came. He found that that already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now, Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, that I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. But notice what Jesus said here in verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection of the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Who, whoever believes, whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Oh, I'm going to ask you, church, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Here we go. Now look here. Verse 27, she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And Jesus said to these things, He went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister. The teacher has come and is calling you. And he heard that she arose quickly and she came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into town, but was in the place where Martha had met him. Then the Jews who were there with her house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly, and she followed him out, saying, he is, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then Mary came to him where Jesus was and saw him. She fell down to his feet, saying, Lord, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore Jesus saw her weeping. And the Jews came out with her weeping. He groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, Lord, come and see. Now I want you guys to look here at verse 35. This is the shortest, most powerful verse in the Bible. And it's two words, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Man, well, I, we could just preach a whole sermon right there. We could, we could preach a whole sermon right there. But then the Jews said, see how he loved them. And some of them said, could not this be the man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Now, I want you guys to think about Jesus in this context here. Okay? Think about this. Think about this for a second. He has, he has, he has, he has showed them so many miracles. This is probably 24 to 48 hours. We don't know exactly before he would ride that full donkey into Jerusalem. 
Okay, think about this. But now let's go to verse 38, and we're going to start the expositional part of the sermon here. Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Everyone say groaning with me, please. Just eight days before his own resurrection, what happens? Jesus comes to a tomb with a big stone in it, right in front of it. Now think about that. Think about the message that Jesus Christ is sending, okay, eight days before it's going to be his tomb. Eight days before the angels of God will come down and roll away his tomb. Let's go back to groaning for a second. That's why I had you say it. Why would Jesus groan? Ask yourself that question. How many times does he have to prove that he's the Son of God? He did all these miracles in front of, in front of the, all the disciples. How many times does he have to prove that he's the Son of God? But I'm going to ask you guys, how many times does Jesus have to prove the Son of God, that he's the Son of God to India Homa First Baptist Church? I mean, I mean, how many times? How many times does he have to prove it to Scott Patton when I act shocked, when I get a prayer answered? When I get shocked when somebody gets saved that I didn't see it coming. <laughs> I just didn't see it coming. And I get shocked. We all do. How many miracles does he have to perform before his own friends, disciples, and families believe? You saw Mary and Martha who saw so many miracles, doubting him. Had you not been here, and you saw, oh, well, oh, doubting Thomas, man, he was all there. Well, we're going to go to Judea and die with Jesus. Man, think about having Thomas on your basketball team or in your work. <laughs> man, think about that dude. He's a cancer, right? Okay, oh, doubting Thomas. But go to verse 39. Let's go to verse 39 here. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him, was dead, who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is stench. He's been dead for four days. Remember when Jesus had already told his disciples before he even got there, he was dead. He's dead. There's no hope. No hope. We got to trust the science, right? You got to trust the science of death, okay? He's dead. Just trust the science here. He's dead. You ever seen a dead, decaying body? It's not pleasant. I'll just tell you. Jesus is giving us a foretaste of the future when he is here with Lazarus. One week later on Easter Sunday, every day a believer in Jesus Christ gets pulled out of that grave. Somebody shout amen. Every day, somebody gets pulled out of that grave. Now think about this. This is why it's so significant that this happened when it did. And I hate to tell you guys this. I never really grasped that until I started doing this research. He's going to give us the foretaste. Yes, death is the final enemy and, and our, our Savior he robbed you out of that grave. He robbed Scott Patton out of that grave. He robbed you out of that grave. He robbed Barry out of that grave. He robbed Margela out of that grave. He robbed Billy Tucker out of that grave. He robbed us out of that grave. He came in there and he said, no, death is not going to come upon you. Think about it. The grave robber is Jesus. Now, when you look at this, technically somebody say he resuscitates Lazarus, but the strategic message is, is resurrection. But I want you to notice something here in the verse here. Martha's reaction. Keep in mind, Martha, she's a faithful servant here. She is a faithful servant that, that man, she, she loved Jesus. She's seen Jesus. And she failed at the last minute. She failed at the her faith failed her at the last minute, right? Remember Peter? Remember Peter walking on water? 
He's watching Jesus. He's watching Jesus. He's watching Jesus. And he said, and he took his eyes off Jesus. And what did he do? He sunk. He sunk. Think about it. That stone. Think about it. He took his eyes. But notice Martha. He said, take away the stone. Open the tomb. But right now he smells. He, he smells horrible. Take away the stone. But most, verse 40, Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Everybody say believe with me. I'm going to ask you again. Do you believe? Can I get a witness? You see the world from where you sit, but you don't need the world. But you don't see the world from where Jesus sits. They can't even fathom what Jesus of Nazareth is fixing to do. They can't even imagine. And this is what happens in our life. We can't fathom what Jesus is fixing to do in our lives today. Jesus gently reminded her of the message he had sent to her at least three days and urged her to believe it. You see, true faith relies on God's power and relies on God's promises, thereby releasing the power of God. How often have I stood in this pulpit and spoke about God's power? How do we get God's power? We get it by believing. We get it by having faith. We get it by praying. We get it by staying in his word. We get it by worshiping in his house. Martha relented, and a stone was rolled away. Let me ask you guys, have you been there? Have you been there? Martha's probably still on the stage right now where, where she, why Jesus? Why? Why did you let my child go astray? Why weren't you there during my divorce? Why did you not heal my mother's cancer? Why did you let an alcoholic father raise me? Why did I not get the promotion at work to feed my family? Why, Jesus, why? Why? We've all asked that question. And I promise you, every single person in this room has been here. Same exact place Martha was. This is why this message is so strategic. Why, Jesus? Then he took, let's go to verse 41. Then he took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes, and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. You see the faith with kingdom eyes we're seeing here, guys? No one could predict what Jesus was fixing to do. Nobody. And this is where we've got to get better. This is where Scott Patton's got to get better. This is where disciples of Jesus, this is what we call discipleship training right here, guys. This is how disciples train. No one could predict what Jesus was going to do. Do you remember the story in 1 Samuel? When the Israel army stood paralyzed in fear for 40 days and 40 nights, a giant of a warrior named Goliath would walk down the valley of Allah and he would say, is there anybody in the Israel army that would like to fight me? And remember what the Israel army did. Remember King Saul, that yellow-backed coward? Yeah, you remember him? <laughs> Nobody would touch Goliath. You remember that? Nobody would touch Goliath. Nobody would stand and fight Goliath. Everybody lacked the courage. For 40 days, there were probably 20,000 soldiers in the Valley of Alos doing a standoff with the Philistine army. And the Philistine commander named Goliath would walk up to the Valley of Elah and he said, does anybody in Israel fight me today? And then a young 14-year-old, dirty, little skinny, nasty shepherd boy named David saw Goliath with kingdom eyes. He saw him as Goliath was. And I'm going to ask you guys, do you see, do you have faith, and do you believe with kingdom eyes today? And what did David say? Do you remember what he said? 
He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? <laughs> That's what the little boy said. A little boy. And what did David do? He put a one stone, nailed him right here. Didn't he, Barry? He nailed him. One stone. I've told you guys the story before. The Israeli army did a, a, a study on the sling that David threw, and it's equivalent, equivalent of a, of a 45 caliber bullet. Okay? That's how fast that sling that David slung. Okay? That's what happens when you bring a, a gun to a knife fight. I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, those who live by the sword, you know, they get shot by those who don't. Somebody shot amen. I'm just saying. That's what happens. But here's the thing. Let's go to verse 42. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may not believe that you sent me. What an incredible gospel message that is. A description of the Trinity. God the Father sent God the Son through the power of the what? The Holy Ghost. Jesus is fixing to yank Lazarus out of that grave. Let's go to verse 43. Now when he had said to these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! Lazarus, come forth! The experience was so incredible example of what happens to a sinner like Scott Patton when he trusts in a Savior. Lazarus was dead. All sinners are dead. He was decayed. And death and decay go together. Also, lost people are spiritually dead. And some are more decayed than others, unfortunately. No one could be more dead than another. But Lazarus was raised from the dead by the power of God who all trust Jesus Christ, who have been given life and been lifted out of that grave. Now, I will tell you, we're going to talk about this on Easter Sunday next week. We all get resurrected. We do. It just depends on where your body is being prepared. You're either going to live in heaven or you're going to live in hell. It's that simple. It's that hard. I mean, that's what's going to happen. Your, your spirit leaves. But this is what you have to think about. There's a new liberty. Today, you're going to see Lazarus stated at the table of Christ. All believers in Christ in heavenly places are enjoying spiritual food right now on Palm Sunday. But let's go to verse 44. And he who came out and died and bound him, hand, foot, with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Wow, this is so cool. A few hours later, Jesus Christ would travel the 1.7 miles from Bethany to Jerusalem riding on a foal donkey, just as predicted 800 years before. News of Lazarus' resurrection sped, uh, spread quickly, and many, many uh, uh, people were curious to see the man. Now, what happened because of that set up everything that you would see for the Holy Week, right? Because what would happen? Remember the Pharisees would find out about this. The Sandra Dan would find out about this. And they said, we can't have this anymore. Who is this man that thinks he can raise people from the dead? See, they thought it was like witchcraft. They thought it was satanic. But it was our Savior yanking him out. And then that would set up the whole chain of events for the Holy Week. It would set up the trial. This was the final trial, uh, final straw that would lead Jesus to a trial with the Roman government and the governor named Pontius Pilate, and eventually his crucifixion. In the darkened minds of the temple leader, Lazarus was the last evidence that they needed to claim Jesus was the Messiah, and it would lead then to the greatest event in human history, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then in closing, I'm going to tell you guys, perspective in God's domain is everything. It's everything. 
We often don't see Jesus as a grave robber, but in reality, that's who he is. That's who he is. Because the last enemy is death. Satan. Let's talk about him just for a second as we close. He uses death to scare us into submission. Why? So he can control us. So he can control us. Lazarus' death was a foretaste of the greatest event in human history. And I, what I'm going to challenge you guys this Holy Week. This is Holy Week. I want you to pray every night that you see things from Jesus' perspective. Because many times we only have the strength to see the world through our limited human view. But remember what he says in Revelation 21.4? He said, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. With every head bowed and all eyes closed. Father God, thank you. Father God, if there's somebody here today that's never believed, how do you believe? You admit we're sinners. We believe that you're the Son of God. We believe in the gospel, which is the birth, the life, the death, and the burial, and the resurrection of you, Father. And then we commit to you forever and ever. Somebody's never prayed that prayer with you. I'm going to invite them to come down today and accept you. Father God, we love you and we praise you and we hallow your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand.